is Michael W. Smith. I was in the Air Force from 1969 to 1973. I was aircraft control and early warning operator, which was basically an aircraft control person, you know, like with airlines and stuff like that. But our job was to, was for the military aircraft side, was to uh, track and give altitudes to uh, for military aircraft or their flights, also to detect and identify any incoming aircraft coming into our airspace. In spring of 1970, while I was stationed in Klamath Falls, Oregon, I came up to the radar site on the evening shift and where there's normally two or three people in the radar room, there was quite a few from the cooks to maintenance, all kinds of people, and I asked what was going on and they said that they was watching a UFO and I immediately was stunned and they asked if the Pentagon was notified, somebody called the president, or, and they said no, they don't do that. And uh, I said, well, we should call the news media or uh, uh, you know, call some call somebody. This is earth-shaking news, and to me, and he said, "No, just calm down." NORAD knows about. It. They called NORAD, and that's when the, uh, the senior NCO pulled me to the side and said that NORAD knows about it. That's the only people we notify. We don't talk about this. We don't tell anybody about this. The people know, no, and we just watch, see what happens, and that's it. That's our job. And I insisted, well, there has to be a report filed or something filed, you know. And they said, well, that there is a report that you can file. It's about an inch thick. And the first two pages is about the sighting. The rest of it is basically a psychological profile of you, your family, you know, your bloodlines, everything. So when the Air Force goes through it, they can discredit you completely by either saying that you know you was on drugs or your mother was a communist or uh, anything to discredit you and uh, you'd never get a promotion and I'd spend the next three and a half years up at the North Pole living in a tent checking the weather balloons you know no hope of promotion so the message is pretty loud and clear you just shut up and don't say anything to anybody It was stationary, wasn't moving at all, and it would slowly lower itself down it would, it would, until it got behind a, a mountain so that you lost radar contact. It would stay down for about 15 minutes, and the next thing you knew it was right back up there. And it was up, you know, 80, 90,000 feet. And then the next, the next sweep of the radar scope, it would be, you know, like 200 miles away, stationary, completely stopped and it would hover there for five, 10 minutes and then slowly start descending until it dropped off radar. Then it would come back up and it did this like three times that, that I seen. I heard that it, it's not an infrequent occurrence out there. They have them quite often, but I seen it actually twice. The object that, that we seen, it was stationary. And then the next sweep of the scope, which the radar has six sweeps a, si uh, a minute, six sweeps a minute, would you know, one sweep it would be here, the next sweep it would be 200 miles away, completely stopped. And there's no aircraft that can accelerate and decelerate that fast without having the pilot's face through the windshield. You know, I mean, it's, it's impossible for gravity to operate that way. So it was obviously something we didn't have. Uh, we never scrambled interceptors on them, so it's obviously something the Russians never had. It's, it, was, it was a UFO. That's the only explanation there was for it. That's and right. the fact that, you know, NORAD, we, that we called NORAD, and they knew about it, or they call, would call us uh, to tell us, uh, NORAD knew about it. And like I said, they just handle it like, it was just, it's just UFO, just, you know, just watch it and see what happens. But don't take any actions, don't tell anybody, don't write it down, don't you know, disclose it. NORAD is North American Air Defense Command. They're in charge of all the airspace of the United States of North America. And it's their job to identify any incoming aircraft, any threats, any 
you know, Russian planes or any any aircraft at all. And so the first thing they do is that any blip that comes in that they don't know what it is, they check it with the flight plans of, of airlines or private carriers or whatever. And it, so everything is identified. So when something like this just pops up on a scope with no flight plan and doing erratic behaviors, it's their job to identify it. They have a tie-in with all the radar stations in North America. It all goes to Cheyenne Mountain, and they so they have like a big screen, and they can they can see any area of the country at any time, and so they that's how they know. Like for instance, this other experience was on third shift. Uh, I was on a radar. And Nora had called me and informed me that there was a UFO coming up to the California coast and it'd be in my area pretty soon. So I said, what do you want me to do? And they said, nothing, just, just watch it. Don't write it down, you know, because we have a logbook that we're supposed to keep track of any, anything out of, the, out of the ordinary, you know, as far as maintenance and things like that, all, all of it's in a logbook. And they said, don't log it or anything, just, just watch it. We're just letting you know, heads up. So, uh, NORAD was well aware, obviously, that, that they're, they were around. And the, the action of the people, when I first seen my first experience, seeing the radar with the UFO on it, the, the action of the people there was like, you know, it doesn't happen every day, but, you know, it happens quite often. And that was my impression. And it was because of the way just everybody was, oh, it's just a UFO. Uh, it was just so calm, and, you know, and I'm all frantic and stuff, but apparently the first time you see a UFO on radar, you know, you realize, you know, well, the government knows about this, why, why aren't they telling the press, why aren't, you know, well, I don't know. The radar, they would be on radar because it was very mountainous out there until it got to a point where the radar, uh, where it went behind a mountain, then obviously it would disappear off the radar. And I don't know if it actually landed or not, but it was off the radar for a good 15, 20 minutes before all of a sudden, boom, it's back up here 90,000 feet instantly. It was explained that, yes, they're UFOs, yes, we know them, but yes, NORAD knows about them, but that's it, this is a secret. They're not supposed to talk about it, don't tell anybody about it, don't make any reports, don't write it down, just shut up and you'll get your next stripe and you be promoted and you will go on from there. My second encounter was while I was stationed in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. It uh, was in 1972, and I believe it was in the fall of 1972. I was working alone that night. Uh, by then I was promoted to a sergeant. Uh, I was working alone that night when I got a phone call from the switchboard operator. He said he had the state police on the phone and wanted to talk to me. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I have a parking ticket overdue or something, but he was real frantic when he got on the phone and said that, uh, that there's three UFOs over the North Tower of the Mackinac Bridge. The Mackinac Bridge connects the Upper Peninsula and the Lower Peninsula of Michigan. So I immediately, you know, turned on the radar and, uh, but my, immediate response was there's nothing on radar and I hung up the phone because it's just something that's programmed into you that's what you're supposed to say there's nothing on radar even if you see something. The North Tower seemed to be a little bit bigger uh, and then I realized that they, they were the UFOs and one took off left the other two and circled Mackinac Island and came back to the other three then all three started going following Interstate 75 north from St. Ignace. In the meantime, I got calls from the sheriff's department. They were frantic, saying, you know, we're chasing these UFOs up the highway. And my response was, there's nothing on radar. Uh, several people called, several civilians. Uh, I believe there was a, a newspaper person called. And in the meantime, I, I called NORAD and told them and they looked and they looked it up and they said oh it's coming up they're going up I-75 I said yes at about 70 80 miles an hour 
Now about halfway between St. Nicholas and Sault Ste. Marie, there's um, Kinslow Air Force Base, which is a SAC base. It's, they have B-52 bombers. They had two, apparently, that were on final approach, and that crosses I-75. And so apparently they diverted those two bombers because they didn't want, you know, if they have nuclear weapons or not, but they didn't want to take a chance on them meeting UFOs about the same altitude crossing the highway. So they diverted the two B-52s. As the UFOs came closer, I realized if they keep going this way, following the highway, they go right by the radar site, which is up on top of like a, a hill, right at Sault Ste. Marie. Bright bluish glow, followed by the flashing red and blue lights of the police cars that were chasing it. So I realized, well, I'm not gonna be able to see it. So I went back in, looked at the scope, and they were gone. Went back outside, couldn't see anything, went back to the scope, nothing. When they asked if I had it on radar, I told them no. It's more of a programmed response, thinking back to Klamath Falls, where you're told you don't talk about it, you don't write it down, you don't discuss it. I was afraid if I said, oh yes, I, I have them on radar, that the next thing I know, newspapers are gonna be up there wanting to talk to me and stuff, and I'd probably get court-martialed, or. I don't know what would happen. It's, it was just instinct saying there's nothing on radar. When there actually was, I was, I was watching them come up the highway. It, uh, they were so close together, it, was, it looked like one return. In other words, it looked like it was one uh, aircraft, but it was very low. The only thing I did was in the logbook, I wrote, wrote this down, wrote the information down. And I told my uh, in, the senior NCO the next day about it. but. That's all you're supposed to do. Don't tell anybody else, don't write it down, although I did write it down. But I doubt if you'll ever find that book, that log book. When I seen this blue glow come by, it was probably 100 yards away where the, where the highway is. It was, it was bright, but not super bright. It, but, but it was totally silent. The only sound I could hear was the sirens from the police cars that were about 100 yards behind it. And I could see the strobing light of the of their of their flashers of their of their beacons. They cover it up. They don't want anybody to talk about it. You know, and this is such remarkable technology. These people come from who knows where. That I would think you'd want everybody to know. Uh, one on a personal note, uh, after this happened from in Oregon, and I came home on leave and told my dad about it. He was red, white, and blue through and through, uh, you know, World War II hero and all this, and very patriotic. And I was explaining to him about these UFOs that we've routinely seen out there. And he said, no, he says, the government says there are no UFOs. And I'm saying, Dad, I've seen these, you know, on radar with my own eyes. And so he was torn. The government would never lie to him, you know. Here's his son, I've never lied to him. So he just didn't know what to do. And it wasn't until years later, to after Watergate, that he, he said, you know, hey, sit down and tell me about this. I, I go, that's lying to me, you know, about a little thing like that. Obviously, they're out lying about something big. It's, it's a government cover-up that doesn't need to be here anymore. There's no more Cold War. Uh, I believe uh, the same thing Dr. Greer does, that. The technology they have, you know, we're burning our fossil fuels up faster than, you know, the ozone and everything. And these people have technologies, they have, uh, it's hard, I, what do they have? They must have something. And the government knows about it, they have these, you know, if they have these aliens, they have these spacecraft, they have this technology, all this, there's a lot of back engineered technology that's pretty obvious. I mean, what else have they got? What and why, who are they? to cover this up. When other governments are coming forward and admitting and showing their files, why, aren't, why, why isn't our government? While I was in the Air Force, there was a number of people that had witnessed UFOs on radar also. A number of pilots I've talked to uh, had chased them or, or come close to them uh, or fly in formation with them. 
when he came down to land. A, a friend of mine was uh, like a, in a tower, and there was a flight of three coming in of uh, interceptors. And he said, no, there's four of you. And the captain's going, no, there's three of us. And he said, well, look around. Sure enough, there was a UFO flying in formation with them. When Dr. Greer brought us down to Washington, D.C. for the briefing, I was very nervous uh, and didn't know what to expect. However, there was uh, about 12 other people there that really amazed me. My, my story is very tame compared to what they've experienced, what they've encountered. And it's, it was a real eye-opener, how deep the secrecy goes, how deep the cover-up is. Uh, everyone from astronauts to, uh, you know, senators and stuff that, that know that there's something going on. Thank mm -hmm. you.